episode 18 of the Busted Limes podcast. I'm your host, Parish Maharaj, and joy to be once again, as usual, is my buddy Black Belt. How you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. And also joining us once again, Grant from the Blade Looking Thieves and One Piece podcast. How you doing, Grant? Hey guys, thanks for having me back. It's great to be here. Once again, I have invaded your space. <laughs> your presence is always welcome here. But oh man, listeners, it has been 10 years since the Pandora box was discovered on Mars and caused the Skywall tragedy. Our country was divided into Toto, Seto, and Hokuto, resulting in untold chaos. <laughs> I'm doing sick motorcycle tricks in the background. You can't see it, though. Everybody's there, <laughs> just out of frame, cheering me on. <laughs> I am punching math. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> the math is breaking through the wall. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, in case any of us is wondering what the hell we're talking about, today we are talking about one of the best pieces of fiction I have ever consumed, my introduction into... Tokusatsu and Kamen Rider. Kamen Rider build. Yes. Oh, man. Yeah. I binged a Kamen Rider build uh, end of last year, and it hooked me all the way through mm -hmm. a wild ride from start to finish. And to explain how Parish and I got on that ride, actually, um, turns out our Troll Hunter episode was a bit of a gateway drug for us into Tokusatsu <laughs> because <laughs> if you don't follow Grant on Twitter, um, one thing you might not know is that he follows the Tokusatsu Gifts Twitter account, and mm -hmm. if you follow Grant, he's going to retweet all of the coolest shit from that. And <laughs> Yes, I am. <laughs> I've been, I mean, my awareness of Tokusatsu has mostly just been knowing it as like, oh yeah, Super Sentai, that's like the Power Ranger source material, but I never really got into it because I thought, oh, pirating, it's too difficult. But seeing all of the cool shit from Kamen Rider, which I had much less of a frame of reference for coming mm -hmm. through the Tokusatsu gifts, eventually I did eventually just tweet at Grant. He's like, okay, you've convinced me. How do I get into Kamen Rider? That's how I get and, them all, baby. Yep. <laughs> I'm, and, uh, I'm a pusher. <laughs> yeah, a very successful one at that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so it's I been, watched... It's been a real pleasure watching you guys slowly descend into Tokusatsu through oh, yeah. this. Like, yes, good, good. <laughs> yeah. So after yeah. Build, I have since watched uh, Kamen Rider O's and uh, recently just watched the first couple episodes of Double, both mm, yes, extremely yes, yes. fantastic. And yeah, I uh, anything that I become hopelessly obsessed with, I have to drag Parish into as well. <laughs> Hence this episode. But Grant, I actually want to hear from you a little bit about uh, how your Tokusatsu journey began, because you've been much more into this than we have for much longer and uh if there's one thing i've learned the last few months is that getting into tokusatsu as an american fan not an easy process yeah that that that's part of it isn't it um so for me it starts like most folks of my vintage in that i was precisely the correct age an elementary schooler when mighty morphin power rangers first aired i remember that summer seeing like the commercials on fox kids and I was like, dinosaur robots, they combine like Voltron, I have to see this. And of course, it became the biggest thing in my life for a long, long time. Um, I stuck with Power Rangers up through about Turbo or so, like seeing the movies and stuff. Um, and then uh, after that, I kind of fell off of it and moved on to other things, although I always had sort of a fondness for it. I would check in every now and then just to kind of see what was happening, but I didn't really follow anything religiously. Um, and then... You know, in college, I had also, in a similar vein, I was like, you know what, I, I know there was, you know, having been a child uh, who enjoyed anime and uh, kaiju movies and martial arts movies and stuff, it was pretty clear to me, um, even in Mighty Morphin, like whenever they had, I mean, of course, she went by Rita Repulsa, but uh, Bandora the Witch is um, quite obviously, you know, speaking another language, and they're just sort of dubbing over, and I was like, oh, you know, I, mm -hmm. I knew pretty early on, like, this is, this is adapted from something from somewhere else, um, so I tried to get into it but had trouble torrenting and just kind of wasn't super comfortable with it at the time so i'd seen a few episodes of random toku uh like i'd seen an episode of zoo ranger um but i i didn't really follow it too heavily but then a few years ago i guess really before i joined fandom proper uh in the new space here with podcasting and all that um i realized i was just sort of randomly surfing around and i was like oh my gosh ultraman the uh, the original 67 show is just on Hulu. Like you can just watch it. Um, 
and so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll watch that. And I watched it and was completely hooked, uh, fell in love with the stuff all over again, and uh, kind of went on a tear um, doing anything and everything I could to watch as many shows as possible, which involved, obviously, uh, uh, not always the most legal of means, but that's just the way it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I soon watched a lot of Super Sentai, Kamen Rider, Ultraman, um, and of course I've, I've seen, I say a lot, I've, I've seen more than most folks but I mean, there's still just there's so much because you know they're putting out new seasons every year, so there's plenty out there to watch. But um, I I became pretty addicted to it pretty quickly, uh, and have become a pusher, uh, constantly trying to get others into it uh, ever since because it's just it's really exciting and uh, and great and wonderful stuff. And of course, it involves a lot of my favorite things. So uh, it's really great to um, to to now be podcasting about it uh, on my own and also. Uh, seeing others take that journey for the first time um, because it's so exciting in many ways that we will discuss later. But uh, yeah, so it, uh, even though I'm only really a, a relatively recent convert, it doesn't matter uh, ultimately. Just you can start wherever. And um, if, if it's your first time, like congratulations, that's the way it is for a lot of folks. Like <laughs> it is designed, most seasons are designed to be enjoyed by, um, you know, small children and sell them plastic toys. So there's not a whole lot of continuity. You just kind of pick one you think looks cool and you jump in. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. And um, I, I can't believe I forgot to mention this when um, I was mentioning your credentials because I was, I was just so excited to talk about this show. But <laughs> you actually do host another podcast, uh, the Super Senpai podcast, I think it is. Correct, correct. Uh, Pat yeah. and I uh, yeah. go through and review uh, Tokusatsu series together. Uh, our first was Lupin Ranger vs. Pat Ranger, which was a uh, sort of uh, cops and robbers Sentai season from about three years ago. And we've done a few other things, but we've also... Um, uh, we're currently doing Ultraman Mabius, uh, which is a very well beloved um, uh, series from that, I guess, stream of Tokusatsu. Because there's, the, you know, as with anything, uh, there's a couple of major spaces, and there's a lot of indie and smaller stuff, and all all over the world. And then you get into like, okay, what counts as Tokusatsu? And it, you know, it can get very esoteric. But it's in general, it's uh, you know, spandex clad. Uh, or lycra clad uh, superheroes uh, from Japan, but there's obviously a, a much bigger world. The more you get into it, you know, it, it's more complicated than that, as it always is. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of bigger worlds and comp uh, being complicated, Common Rider Build is legitimately one of those shows that I would put on par with. And honestly, side note, I hate to compare it to Avatar: The Last Airbender as t in terms of quality kids TV, but I but I feel like that's the comparison is almost. I don't, uh, inevitable, I guess, because that, that because what other frame of reference do we really have? Yeah, I mean, there's newer stuff when people talk about like you know high bar for children's shows. They talk about I think recent stuff is like Steven Universe, Gravity Falls, Shira, which I yeah, haven't watched yeah. very closely. But I mean, I think generally when you talk about having a high bar for um children's media, like I think things you look for is themes that you know you can generally appreciate at all ages regardless of complexity mm -hmm. and you know sort of a sense of taking your audience seriously and not necessarily watering down what you're trying to sell to them like right exactly i think in the, on the topic of common writer build specifically um something that i think made the show resonate with me and hook me so quickly two things um first thing it took me a couple episodes to realize that unlike a lot of other tokusatsu or kids shows in general common writer build after the first few episodes doesn't actually follow a super rigid monster of the week format which you know allows it to be much more mm -hmm. um plot driven and character driven which i really enjoyed because you know part of the reason the show was so e easy to binge is pretty much every episode leaves you wondering what's going to happen next mm -hmm. and the episode structure is much less um you know, predictable than you might, you know, remember from watching Power Rangers as a kid, because there's no guaranteed, okay, it's the last five minutes, time to get in the robots and fight the giant version of the monster. It's very varying um, plot structures between episodes, which is refreshing. And, you know, now with the frame of reference of having watched other common writer media, I'm aware that now that's actually a bit of a divergence, I think, from other common writer series as well. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's all good points and probably worth bringing up because I think a lot of folks are going to be familiar with Power Rangers and understand the story beats, right? Like Power Rangers is the multicolored team stuff. They fight monsters on the ground. They get in robots and fight the big monsters. And, you know, it's a kind of weekly uh, formula where, okay, they have to solve some problem this week. And the monster is probably themed around, 
you know, some moral lesson we have to learn, right? People are, are at least right. through cultural osmosis probably familiar with that uh, setup. And Super Sentai, which is the series that um, uh, Power Rangers is, is uh, taking or adapting its footage from, is uh, obviously it's a little it, it's a it's very very different. Uh, by and large, but it at least roughly follows that same format. It's a team show that is about the ensemble cast, you know, and is going to focus on certain themes. And then most of these series are somewhere in the ballpark of 40 to 50 episodes, usually on the higher end, closer to 50. Um, and, uh, but that, the Power Rangers uh, is, pr- or I should say Power Rangers or Super Sentai is really focused in on that kind of multi-tiered uh, element. You're going to have, the characters on foot battling a lot. You're going to have vehicles, like usually motorcycles, or they're kind of individual zords or whatever. And then you're also going to have the giant combiner fight stuff. And that kind of three tiers of combat with lots of different, you know, stuff in between the suits and transformations and powers and all that. that but that general format is there for Super Sentai. Common Rider is also produced by Toei, uh, like Super Sentai is, but it doesn't really have the giant monster component. There's no kaiju. If there's uh, mostly just the sort of ground level stuff with with kaiju and the, the smaller ones. Um, and usually, you know, common rider literally just means masked rider. So there's usually right. a motor a motorcycle right. involved in some way, um, based on the original uh, by Shotaro Shinomori. Um, but common rider usually, whereas Super Sentai focuses on uh, pretty relatable themes, even for you know sort of American superhero comics with you know, teamwork and camaraderie and the team having to come together and the particular relationships between certain team members or enemies or what have you. Um, Kamen Rider, again, each season is its own thing, but Kamen Rider usually has something to do with the special suit and usually some kind of theme around, uh, you know, human weapons in some way, whether it's what happens when you become a human weapon or whether, you know, some group experiments on someone to make them a weapon or, you know, it, there's there's some kind of element of the cost of being, uh, you know, a human weapon of some kind. And obviously that's going to vary a whole lot, but that's usually a, a recurring theme uh, for Common Rider. And you're going to get into this thing where... Um, you know, within Tokusatsu fandom, there's always there's always arguments among people about you know, oh, is, which one is the more serious one or adult one or whatever. I mean, at the end of the day, this is again children's media. Um, it is ultimately about selling mm-hmm. plastic singing belts to children. But as you guys mentioned, like with mm-hmm. Avatar, it is long form and serialized, and it obviously there are times when it's you know, as I as I like to say, the two moods are this is for children and this is for children, right? It's kind of those yeah. two <laughs> warring <laughs> themes where it's like, okay, you're, this guy is a he's half vacuum cleaner, half lion. You're clearly trying to sell me a toy, but then four minutes later, you're watching someone you know disappear into existential memory shards while their lover holds them in their hands and you're like whoa this got heavy for six-year-olds real fast uh and that's in the same episode uh so um but common rider build is uh like most common writers about human weapons again as you mentioned earlier in the intro there's the war right and the wall and all that stuff but the Mm -hmm. one of the things that differentiates uh build i should say differentiates it is um what we'd call a writer war season where you have you don't just have one writer. You have multiple writers often battling one another. Um, and those tend to be pretty po- – well, it's hard to say. Everybody's got their favorites and their darlings. But writer war seasons tend to be pretty exciting because you have lots of uh, cool suits and lots of cool suits punching each other. Uh, and you you don't have to – even though I'm a big fan of the Monster of the Week stuff, you don't have to lean into the monsters quite as much because you can have – uh, the heroes fighting each other, quote unquote, and that's exciting too for different reasons. So oh, that's that's part of what makes it so exciting is the writer war element for sure draws bef- in that drama. Yeah. And before we get too far into um the next part, I think probably a good idea at this point, um about seventeen minutes in to quickly summarize the premise of the show that we're discussing. For, sure. for those for who sure. might <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. common writer build yeah. as um Parish uh rattled off at the beginning of the episode is um this common writer season from I believe 2017, Correct, and 2017, yeah. and then they usually run over a little bit. So I think this yeah. one ran into 2018, if memory serves. Yeah, because they usually start like in the middle of the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That and tracks. so the premise is essentially that 10 years before series start, um, and space expedition landed a drone, landed a manned expedition on Mars and brought back a Martian artifact that on Earth essentially exploded and 
raised a giant wall called the Sky Wall that split Japan into three separate nations. And at the time of the series, these three nations are essentially at war with each other over um, resources and um, the original uh, Martian artifact known as Pandora Box that caused the Sky Wall to appear. And during all this, you have the main character, uh, Kiryu Sento, who um, is Common Rider build, and sort of the transformation gimmick slash main toy they're trying to sell for this season is... Um, so Common Riders always use belts to transform, and the gimmick for this season is K Sento has um, the bottles that he puts into his belt to transform, and they are all in pairs called Best Matches, which is usually a combination of an animal and some kind of machine. That mm -hmm. And his... Um, yeah, and that's kind of where sort of the... Um, versatility of the fight scenes comes in because he has such a diverse power set that he's constantly cycling through based off of what he's fighting as well mm -hmm. as you know the merchandise driving which is collect all 60 bottles to use with Absolutely. your build driver toy which <laughs> I mean, and of course and all um, the different color combos for the figures you can sell now because you yeah. can combine those suit colors in so many different ways <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah oh, you know, got a mix and match yeah. to get them all mm -hmm. of, and, of course yeah and um <laughs> I'll go ahead and establish this right before we go any further. Are we just going all... We're going to go all out with spoilers, right? Because, I mean, it's hard to discuss. Oh, absolutely. This. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. Fair warning. Yeah. Common Rider Build is a very plot twist heavy series, so it's nearly impossible to discuss anything past episode 16 without spoiling something major. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, this is your warning. Um, if you <laughs> don't want to um, get spoiled on the entirety of the season, skip to the end where um, we won't tell you how to watch this series if you're listening, <laughs> Toei. We definitely will not be be helping people consume your product. Why would we Certainly do that? Not. No, no, Never. no, 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 no. But I'm um, yeah. No, not at all. <laughs> but just to give, but summarize my thoughts uh, before we get to the spoilers about whether you should watch it. Uh, yes, uh, I said at the beginning that it's legitimately one of the best pieces of fiction that I have ever consumed. So yes, good, um, good. Oh well, yeah, I have yes, not yes. been this emotionally invested in a narrative in a very long time, mm -hmm. and um. When we get to the ending, I'll talk more about that, but I will say this is one of those endings where it's very bittersweet because it's a satisfying ending, but you're sad the series is over because you want to keep spending time yep. with these characters. <laughs> oh, you know, yes. there's a, a Gintama, which is, a, a you know, obviously a long-running manga yeah. and anime series. Sirachi is a big tokusatsu head, and uh, one of Gintama is pretty well known for its comedic title yeah. cards, and one of, one of them is that... Uh, uh, it, one of the longer ones is something like every time a new Super Sentai series comes out, you can't stand it at first, but when it's over, you're sad to see it go, or something like wow. that. That's, that's how it is. You're like, oh, this looks too different. I don't, I don't want to like it. And then it's, by the time it's done, you're like, no, no, my babies. God. <laughs> yeah. But it's good. It's oh good gosh, for yeah. it's it's good to hear you guys say that uh, specifically because build. Um, the part of the reason I recommended it is because it was not my first, but as soon as it came out uh, and and I got a chance to watch it, I was like, yeah, this this has become my new go to recommend to get people hooked. And so every time people say this is my first, thanks for recommending it. I can't wait to watch a million more. It's like good, good because that's exactly what it's supposed to do. This is a, a great entry series. Yeah. Out of curiosity, what was your um, go to recommendation before Build? Um, so it used to be double because that was what I was first recommended on, and classically speaking, uh, that's what a lot of people used to recommend and still often do because double is a, a, a well. I mean, the Heisei era went on for quite a while. Fans uh, quite arbitrarily used to break up Heisei into basically just normal Heisei and what they called Neo Heisei, and that was usually starting with double because the series before that decade was kind of an anniversary series, and decade has a lot of time travel shenanigans and like references to other series and again like most to toku series you don't actually have to know all the connections but decade really benefits from uh it not being your first i guess i would say uh even though i do know some people who it was their first um but but double was kind of a fresh start you really didn't need to know anything uh and it was a great uh segue kind of demarcation line and that's usually how it is with sentai too like whenever there's an anniversary season I love anniversary seasons, but you're always going to get more out of it if you know all the references and stuff that they're making and why certain callbacks are important. So it's usually better to not start on an anniversary season. So that was why double. And also the, the boys are good. They're great boys. They're good boys. Yeah, speaking as someone whose first Power Ranger um, series was a uh, anniversary episode, um, 
it, I can relate to that because it's like you can enjoy it just fine. But I mean, if you're mm -hmm. just seven years old watching it because it's what's on Jetix on the Saturdays you don't have school, <laughs> you might miss yeah. out on the um, how shall we say, significance of the Power Rangers mentor figure in that season being Tommy fucking Oliver. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, Dino Thunder. Yeah, yeah. that's a good one. Yeah, no. Another great example of like uh, uh, like it's it, you can appreciate it much better. If yeah. you know that background, but you don't have to. Yeah. I mean, the, the, and but, to in yeah. my def well, not in my defense, actually, a strike against me is they do clarify that he is a former Power Ranger. But like, if you don't see the specific episode where they bring that up, like you could totally miss it. Although yeah. we're, we're getting a little bit off topic, but I will say the um, I the I think it's the battle within is the name of the episode. There's an episode of mm -hmm. Dino Thunder where Tommy's essentially in his own mindscape and he has to yeah. fight his previous <laughs> Ranger selves. So if you want to see an unmorphed um. JDF fighting the White Ranger, Green Ranger, and Red Zero Ranger, like, just for the hypeness of that, <laughs> that's your episode. Yeah, I'm not a huge, you know, even as someone who, like, I love the Green Ranger, but I'm very so-so on Tommy Oliver, but uh, that's especially because JDF is, is uh, he's a little... Oh, is he? Well, he, he's been here, he's been around for a long time, and he's make that pretty well known, uh, but... I mean, dude's um, basically the fucking Wolverine of classic Power Rangers at that point. I mean, like, the Sony Pictures Power... Yeah. Yep. Sony Pictures <laughs> yeah. Wolverine of Power Rangers. Yeah, that he's... Uh, yeah. But that's a good season, and I think he actually... Benef I mean, as ridiculous as it is to cast Tommy Oliver or JDF as a scientist, I think he does well in the mentor role in that season, and I think that's where he's probably at his most bearable is that season so and that's just a good season to, all around to their oh. credit they kind of call themselves out on that in um operation overdrive which is another anniversary series because um mm -hmm. adam the black ranger played by johnny young bosch comes back and he just straight up has yeah. a line because um the dino thunder yellow rangers in that episode as well and he's just straight up like i still can't believe tommy became a doctor are you kidding me <laughs> <laughs> like even the characters understand that this is a questionable <laughs> writing choice yeah I love Johnny Young I mean, to be He's fair, so great. We must protect him. Oh, for sure. And to be fair, I think we all have at least one um, high school classmate who we checked them out on Facebook or LinkedIn a little while later, and we're like, really? <laughs> you? <laughs> Speaking oh, of man. questionable scientists, Sento. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yes. no. Oh, my God. So, Sento, or is it Takumi? <laughs> or is it Sato Taro? Actually, it's definitively not that one, but... <laughs> yeah, oh, God. I will say, yeah. he's dead. Yeah, if we're going to go through all the characters and discuss them, let's start with Sento and just say, there. it's so rare, honestly, for, with most franchises, for the protagonist to be everybody's favorite character, but Sento is uh -huh. just such a well-written character. I mean, the arc that he goes through, and not just that, but just... The way he's so instantly endearing to the audience when he shows up. Mm. Like, the kid-friendly mm -hmm. mad scientist shtick, but also, like, a super egotistical, like, knows he's the main character. How can you not love that? <laughs> God, yeah. That, that, yeah, it's just that swagger that really sells him at the beginning. But he's... But, oh, my God. Um, and even then, like, in later episodes... I'm, I'm just gonna jump around all over the series because... Oh, sure. I That's fine. <laughs> and uh, so, I'm just gonna say one word and any fan will know what I mean. Yabe. Yeah, yabe. Oh, yeah. Ciao. Yabe. <laughs> like, my God. When, I, I, I will always appreciate it when a piece of media could pull off Man of Steel better than Man of Steel. And this <laughs> got the scene where he kills the member of the Hibbo trio, I mean the Hokuto mm -hmm. trio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The Hokuto trio. Um, we'll get to more, we'll get to them later, but, uh, it was just gut wrenching because I mean, Black Belt yeah. was. Uh, we watched this over Discord. He he got to hear my reaction to that uh, yeah. as it happened. Yeah, I, and uh, I, yeah, my first uh, word was just fuck. Yeah, like you go into that. That was one of those things where it was like, are they really gonna go there? Like that's your feeling the whole fight, and then they go there, and it's like, oh sh yeah. shit. I mean, like. Going as far as to have your main character use, like, a berserker power-up, which, like, you know, is not, like, a foreign concept to most fans of this type of media, but, like, to have them use a berserker power-up and then have them actually lose control and fully straight-up kill someone and then, like, deal with the aftermath for essentially the rest of the series is a bold fucking move. Yeah, yeah. The, the and that's happened so early on. Um, I, I think one of the things that's really interesting about Build is that, you know, as you mentioned before, there's kind of an expected tempo to these things. Um, you know, Zoo Ranger, the the base for Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, 
uh, had the first, mm-hmm. you know, the season with the first kind of definitive sixth ranger when he showed up, uh, the Green Ranger, around like episode 17 or something like that. And so a lot of Sentai and Common Rider seasons and things like that typically uh, are somewhere in the like 15 to episodes, you know, somewhere between the episodes, I don't know, 15 to 18 or something like that, you're going to get a new character, right? You know, somewhere around the midway point, the the real villain might get previewed. And then somewhere in the back third, okay, we're really going to start hitting the plot now. Like, there's kind of an expected tempo, but build, um, I would say the, the probably those first five episodes alone are just like, the pacing is like relentless. Yeah. And it's, even as someone who yes, had seen oh quite a bit of tokusatsu before, I was like, all right, I know what I'm in for. I was just like, whoa, okay, we're just, we're cooking. And stuff like the the death of, of one of the Hokuto trios, like that, that sticks with, that really is a, a lasting mark in yeah. the series and Sento's arc and stuff. And it was just like, it was really nice to see uh, pacing wise and writing wise, that stuff carry through in a way that doesn't always happen in every season. Yeah. I mean, the pace picks up really rapidly. I think I remember messaging you after I finished the eighth episode. I was like, <laughs> wow, this is escalating way faster than I expected. <laughs> and I mean, yeah. to put it in perspective of how quickly <laughs> the series escalates, um, the plot twist reveal that Sento is actually um, Katsuragi Takumi happens in like mm-hmm. the 14th or 15th episode. That's less mm-hmm. than a quarter of the way through the season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a 49 episode series, folks. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing that you're, okay, yeah, you can see a twist like, we know there's going to be some kind of twist like that, yeah. but it happens so early. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, in fact, complain that Build starts so strong that it's almost it's almost hard for it later on to keep kind of the same momentum. But uh, as a longtime fan, it's really hard to overstate the the mark those early episodes make because they're just, yeah. they're moving it up. You're like, okay, I'm going to get 10 or so episodes of just Monster of the Week stuff because we got to meet the characters. Who, yeah. who are the cast members? And it just doesn't give you any room to breathe. Nope. It's just like, no, we're going. <laughs> sp- speaking of early episodes and impactful moments, um, you mentioned this is a writer war series and, you know, most common art series have more than one writer. And I, I guess there's usually one that's like the designated um, sidekick or, you know, sort of the Nightwing secondary the writer. series. Yeah, so, there's always a secondary writer, or I shouldn't say always, but a secondary writer has become quite common. Yeah. Uh, so Yeah, so I mean, talking about like who honestly might be one of my favorite common writers ever, Banjo Ryuga. Yeah, um, Banjo Ryuga. Yeah, ah, yes. yeah a falsely convicted, um, escaped mer- felon um, out to prove his innocence and maybe along the way learn to become a hero. And my mm-hmm. god, just his character arc as well, just him going from, you know, not a bad person, but still very self-serving, and essentially, you know, getting his powers and then learning to care enough about other people to use them to protect them, mm-hmm. is just mm-hmm. such a mm-hmm. well Because, I mean, I think the idea of, you know, with great power comes great responsibility is such a common trope in superhero stories, obviously, but, like, usually the superhero fig- figures that out pretty quickly, it takes mm-hmm. Bonjo a while after he becomes a common writer to figure out the whole defending people thing. Like his main objective for a while is proving his innocence. Yeah. Yeah. It helps exactly. him that he's a complete himbo though. It keeps him from getting <laughs> too unlikable. Yeah. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. He's also part alien, which is cool. Yeah. And I mean his yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Just real casual. Yeah. Like, any by the way, other he's series an throwing that plot twist in, I'd be like, oh, come on, really? You're just running out of ideas. But, like, again, it's execution that matters. And learning that at that point in the series, like, immediately when it becomes relevant, hits in just the right way. Because mm-hmm. if you had learned that, like, 12 episodes earlier, I don't know that it would have had the same impact. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it was honestly, it, it, it was still properly built up. Like, the, the, they left a lot of room for interpretation or a lot of room to breathe or a lot of room to speculate really it is yeah early i mean backstory it was clear because, from the beginning yeah. there was something special yeah. about bonjo anyway yeah and i right, mean right yeah the build up to his first transformation sequence and then that payoff is literal goosebumps literal yeah. goosebumps and then he comes out with one of the best common rider suit designs in the whole series yes the i cannot remember common the rider cross yeah. Wait, Cross Z? Yeah, Common Rider Cross, or... Cross Z. How... I, I thought it's... you were talking about the Mag one. The... <laughs> we'll have to talk about suits later, but yeah, but it, it's it's interesting, I guess, to talk about uh the suits for Banjo because like it's such a it's such a strong season for suit designs. Yeah. That I think a lot of people would probably say like on the net, I think Banjo probably has the worst suits 
like on the whole, even though his suits are all really incredible, it's like I mean, his, his, this, the yeah. competition's really yeah. stiff in this season. His only really bad um, suit, I mean, not even bad, but like compared to the other suits in the series, I think was like his second suit from the Splash Driver. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Crystal yes. Pepsi one. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. Crystal Pepsi is yep, a yep. little weak. I still like it, but it is kind of it, his weakest. Yeah. I love his magma suit. Oh, his the magma one where suit's he gets the, the one's like hot, 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 hot. Oh, yeah. oh man, that. Yes. That's oh, I mean, it's also suit. such a good like earned power up too. Like his first transformation into that one when he brings out the insert song. That's mm-hmm. insane. Which that's another mm-hmm. quick aside. All the music for this series is top tier. Like especially in the later part of the series where you start getting insert oh, for songs sure. for characters. I mean, it's just. Like, that shit has been permanently added to my playlist all the time now. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that's how it Hell goes. Yes. Yep. And that's one okay. of those things that I think a lot of, you know, especially if you're used to media that has transformation sequences and stuff, um, transformation sequences are really, really great. Anybody, you know, you, you have to get used to them and just kind of understand that, like, it, it's par for the course. But what's so exciting about transformation sequences, and I'll go on about this all day long is that they're you know they're <laughs> they're a ritual it's just like an opening and an ending it it sets the mood and sets the tone and gets you ready for what's going to happen and then when they mess with those expectations you know they change a transformation or okay and this time instead of standing still they're like running up the stairs right or oh, somebody gets knocked out of their transformation or a cracked yeah. visor happens even just those yeah. little changes are just like <gasps> such big hype moments because they're messing with the well, ritual in some way yeah. and that's really really powerful or someone responds to the announcer voice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Which I think that's a good segue to the next character I want to talk about. Yeah. So it, Kazumi. Yep, the third common writer who appears yeah. in the series, common writer Greece, Kazumi Sawatari, who My or boy. Sawatari, who man, this character is talking about layered characters, this character is an onion mm-hmm. and a half, and I mean that with the utmost affection. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, at first glance, he's the cool, aloof super soldier that um, the main characters have to fight when the war breaks out. He's their first real rival common Rider to appear. Then it turns mm-hmm. out he's an e-girl simp. We'll get to that character in a <laughs> yes. second. Then it turns out mm-hmm. um, he's not only an e-girl simp, he's actually essentially a self-inflicted martyr for the sake of his friends with a mm-hmm. deep heart of gold. And then it turns out that he's a brilliant cook and a good enough friend that, you know, he's earned the quite literally undying loyalty of all the people around him despite being only 29 years old. Which, Mm -hmm. I mean, I want to unpack that aspect of Kazumi's character a little bit. So he comes along with the Hokuto trio, his three um, friends who enlisted with him who are basically their whole thing is they're completely loyal to him because he's their boss on the farm he runs and they owe him their lives and fortune so I just want to unpack this quickly, because Kazumi is 29 years old, as he says in the series, which means he was 19 when the Skywall disaster happened. So either he was already in charge of the farm when he was 19, or he became the owner of the family farm very early in his 20s. And somehow, mm-hmm. despite becoming, you know, ending up in that position that early on, and facing such insurmountable odds with, you know, the dying farmland after the disaster... And still dealing with all that, he was such a good enough boss and good enough person that all of his employees, not just the tri- trio, all of them regard him with that level of respect and loyalty that they're willing to literally follow him into a war zone and die for him. Mm-hmm. Literally. Yeah. And so much of that is showing, not telling, because all of what I said is just extrapolated from things that people say about him. You learn what kind of a person he is long before he actually shows it to you from seeing how mm-hmm. highly the Hokuto trio regard him. And I mean, Mm -hmm. yes, like, I can see some people being a little annoyed by his whole, like, um, infatuated with Misora stick, but, like, it's not, it's not like, you know, frickin' Mineta or something where that's literally his only defining trait. Right, And, like, also, it's never really, like, only barely tolerated by the rest of the cast. They still give him enough shit for it that he ends up being the butt of the joke anytime it flares up. The running gag where he's he thinks he's speaking in his mind, but it's like, dude, you're see- you said all of that out loud. Yeah. What the hell? How, how can you hear my internal monologue? It's very external right now. <laughs> One of the best lines in anything. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And... Yeah, and his arc ends up, I think, being one of the most tragic arcs in the series. Because as we mentioned earlier, um, Sento kills one of his friends. And while they do team up later, over the course of the war, he loses all three of his closest friends. And seeing the kind of the mm-hmm. spiral that he takes, trying to find that new purpose for himself, all mm-hmm. leading up to, you know, his transformation at the end of the series, um, where instead of saying Henshin, 
in response to the are you ready chant he just says you're damn right i am and you know yeah i honestly that is one moment that i'm not going to explicitly spoil the full context of because that moment deserves its full gravity going in completely so unspoiled yeah yeah yep and yep yeah and yep. Um, segueing from that to um, quickly talk about some of our non-writer supporting cast. Um, oh, we, hell yeah. we do have one more writer to talk we about. We do, but I want to get to him in a second. Oh, you want to talk about... Oh, okay. I want to talk about okay. the rest of the um, main cast before we get to him, because I think, honestly, that's probably one of the writers I'll talk about the most. Um, fair, fair. So, of course, you have to have your non-superpowered um, supporting cast. Um, non-superpowered, a bit of a stretch in this case. But, um... Yeah. And so, for reference... um. Kiryu's base of op- Kiryu Sento's base of operations is fittingly a coffee store, which I mean, to be fair, me going into the series was like, oh my god, all the characters are complete like scatterbrains, and their base of operations is under a coffee shop. This is literally all of my favorite tropes rolled up in one. <laughs> but yeah, and so first up, you have um, Misora Isurugi, um, who's um, the daughter of the coffee store's owner, who we'll get to in a second. Oy. Yeah, um, and uh, she essentially is. Sento's um almost his guy in the chair type trope character um Mm -hmm. her whole thing um aside from that is mainly she is essentially a internet idol um or as American audiences might better understand a uh e-girl streamer um which not in a lewd sense this is a kids show but like her whole thing is she gathers information and um intel for them by just um, asking all of her simps online to send her <laughs> donations and information, which is just hilarious. Like, hello, yes. all of my simps, please send us highly classified government information we can use to save the day of this episode. Thank you. <laughs> that's a, not an exaggeration. Not exa- that literally yeah. happens in the second episode. <laughs> that's textual. Yeah, and of course, her other bit is that um, as a result of the Skywall tragedy as well, um, she is also wears a bracelet that contains the alien consciousness that grants her some level of um magic powers which includes um being able to purify bottles and essentially create new power-ups for sento to use throughout the series mm-hmm. yeah and she's a pretty cool character because i mean first of all I'll just talk about that actress's acting i think might have been like some of the best acting in this whole series mm-hmm. like, Agreed. She, yes yeah and i mean the raw emotion that she puts into all of her scenes is Again, it's one of those things where I watch is like, this is a kid's show? This feels like yeah, I should, kid's... like, be paying ten bucks for a movie ticket to go see this. This is intense. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. M- Misora, since she doesn't get to do really any fight scenes, she really ends up becoming one of the emotional anchors for the cast. And some of the best, I think, you know, non-fight scene um, dialogues come from the other common writers sort of coming back to the coffee shop and just, you know her being the sounding board for them with, you know, all their traumas going back and forth and her being the one who kind of has to remind them every now and then that, you know, you, you're you fighting for the greater good here and you have to kind of push through to that and seeing how she kind of, you know, is beaten down about as badly as any other character despite not having any fight scenes and still manages to provide that level of encouragement and you know, resol- resolve for the other characters, I think, is really mm-hmm. makes her character stand out so much more because of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And oh my gosh, to get to just speaking of emotional high points, the scene where she's possessed and Sento has to fight her, and it's just like, oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh God. Because uh, this was after the, the Berserker scene where he killed one of the Hokuto trio. So the whole time you're thinking to yourself, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh no. Oh no. Because yeah. oh, no. oh, no. <laughs> that's on yeah, the table, man. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's the thing. When you have a, the hazard form kill someone in its first appearance, you have that mm-hmm. on the table every other time it shows up. That that's how yep. you set up a threat. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Well, speaking I, of a threat... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was going to say, um, one more um, non-powered character who um, yeah. Yeah. really brings an emotional core to the group is um, Sawa. I can't remember her last name, but um, yeah, Sawa is yeah. the other um, non-powered member of the main cast, and aspiring, intrepid uh, freelance journalist who um, meets up yes. with the group by yeah. figuring out Sento's identity and convincing him to let her do an article on him to help his publicity in exchange for, you know, her hopefully getting her big scoop that helps her um, ascend the ranks of journalism. And, of course, she has her own tragic backstory that gets unpacked over the course of the series, but 
Mm. Well, early on, she provides mm. a lot of comic relief from being kind of like the one normal person chasing around all the fight scenes. But, you know, <laughs> she has utility through um, mm. information gathering as a journalist and, again, provides not just exposition, but um, an emotional sounding board for a lot of the other characters, especially as her dynamic with the group changes um, as her backstory mm. comes out. God, and boy, does it does the dynamic change. Oh, my God. the. Yeah. Because that was the the reveal of her backstory was one of the many earlier things that hooked me to this show. Because I just thought to myself, you know what? In a lesser show, she would have just been, well, the guy in the chair. Yeah, and just we would right. we probably would, we probably would have only seen her at the base of operations, never out in the field. Right. And mm-hmm. the minute the more we got of her, the more we got of her backstory, she quickly became my favorite female character. Like, yeah, of course. That's a high, tall order because no, that's not taking any, anything away from Misora, but yeah. Sawa is my personal favorite just for yeah. the way she's treated and the way she is. Yeah. And I think something that in general helps, I think, build cast, well, not helps, but really, you know, helps the dynamic work so well is that most of the characters are grown adults. Like, I think Misora's the only yeah. main character under the age of 20, and even then she's like 19. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And the, the cast feels uh, even, you know, whether it's uh, a writer or a side character or what have you, even the, you know, the Hokuto trio or what have you, the, the cast generally feels like it's treated very well. Uh, you don't really feel like a lot of characters get, like, just completely shoved aside or that they don't get their moments or what have you. Um, obviously, of course, there's there's things we change or, or what have you, but it doesn't really feel like the show is uh, squandering anyone or exactly. mistreating them i guess like you, you you don't feel like they're like oh this character is just one note um even the characters single notes get a lot of attention so oh it's, it's a really it's a really great season um that really manages to balance a lot of big personalities like you would think some of the characters they would maybe tone down because there's already so much going on there's already so many characters to track but there are a lot of characters a lot of personality for all of them and they have a lot of richness and backstory that like it's just like it's really impressive how all that gets done in a 22 minute show for children right oh yeah <laughs> yeah like and i'm not i'm not going to go into too much detail about this but everything everything you said i think the perfect encapsulation of that is utsumi oh yeah mm-hmm. cuz yeah, you talk about side characters who who are just never one note. This guy gets literally mm-hmm. shot off of a bridge, and he still comes back to have one of the biggest <laughs> scenes in later on mm-hmm. in the series. Oh, yeah. Which I, again, yeah, which again, I I, I kind of want to leave something for people to I'm yeah. not spoil what it is. But you gotta, gotta yeah, you don't want to reveal all the plot points, but at the same time, like right. even if you knew all the plot points. The way in which the you know execution counts too, Absolutely. and the execution here is so good that like even yeah. if I watched it again, it would still have that same resonance. Yeah. I think it's a really well done season. Yeah. And I think yeah, one exact. one guy I really want to talk about next then is um Gentoku Himuro, who yes begins the series as a um government official who is initially Sento's boss, but we also learn very quickly is in fact um the villainous Night Rogue, and then mm. later on promoted to Common Rider Rogue. And I mean, I'm going to say this right off the bat, possibly one of the most well-executed redemption arcs I've seen in anything. Like, so good. I mean, Absolutely. So good. I, I think Absolutely. the one what sells his redemption arc for me is that it's not like he suddenly becomes good and starts working with the main cast. Like, they start working together because their goals align, and he has to earn every bit of trust that he gets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, there, there's a mm-hmm. point where they very explicitly say, you're working with us, but some of the things you've done have not been forgiven. And he just has to bur- carry that burden throughout the end of the series. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, what also helps, though, is the fact that he has a terrific suit. Common Rider Rogue is such a great okay. suit. Yeah. Like, He's I'm going to forgive a lot of sins. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but... you, you show up with possibly one of the best suit designs in a series that contains a lot of the best suit designs. Yeah, a lot can get forgiven very quickly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm I'm willing to round up on his behalf, and I uh, just just and all his little comedy bit with the shirts and oh, stuff yeah, like for that sure. is <laughs> yes. Oh and, my god. And talk about great <laughs> acting. Like everybody in this show is a phenomenal actor, but Gentoku especially just portraying a character who is constantly on the edge and the occasional mm-hmm. dips onto either side of that edge is just it's. It is campy, but in a way that has layers to it. I'm saying layers a lot, but there is real depth 
to Gentoku that gets really well thoroughly explored throughout the series. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, ex- exactly. And I think a big part of it is that his fundamentally his core values do not change throughout the entire series. It's just that right. the way he goes about doing it uh, changes because God, the, you got, it's like one of those that Simpsons was like you could uh, you could uh, see the moment where his heart breaks here you could see the you could <laughs> you could see but here it's more like you could see the moment where he realizes though what he that he needs to be a good guy now and you can see the, the moment scene, oh, where he realizes yeah. he still has a heart there you go <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, and I, yeah. Think, I think it's quite I think it's quite masterful I guess because like you were just saying that he, it's a really good redemption arc and it's not really so much that he gets redeemed and like a, oh i forgive him and everything he did did is justified but so everyone in the cast has to make certain sacrifices or make some horrible decisions or has blood on their hands in some way it's it's not really so much that gentoku is redeemed in the sense of like ah well we can cross out all the bad he's done it's just that everyone ends up doing some horrible things or making some tough decisions and so his softening doesn't feel it feels earned because they're ultimately a very flawed cast and none of them are really perfect um so it Mm -hmm. it, it works really naturally ultimately by the end you do end up with a cast of pretty thoroughly broken people who in spite Mm -hmm. of their flaws and sins are trying to save the world and i think that's what exactly yeah which i think is what part of the charm of the series comes from is especially with a lot of moments near the end is um you know these are all people who have done or end up doing terrible things over the course of the series a lot Mm -hmm. of times in the name of the greater good but through it all they manage to find each other and become a found family and i mean there's a moment in like one of the last episodes before like the characters know they're about to go into the final battle and they have a cookout on the rooftop of the building and they're setting off fireworks and it's just that episode yeah there's it's just (laughs) It's so sad because you know they're going that they know they're going into their final battle, but it's that in spite of mm-hmm. all of this, and you know there have been moments all throughout, but just that even in this moment they found time to be a family, and like there's so so much of the comic relief just comes from the characters bouncing off of each other's insanity, which mm-hmm. again I want to say the comic relief in the series works so well. I think almost because the comedy is such much-needed breaks from the direness of the later episodes, but mm-hmm. it, it very uh-huh. rarely feels forced. Like, a lot of comedy and children shows also sometimes feel like, okay, that was a little immature, that was a little, like, low-hanging fruit, but, I mean, the comedy is generally very, you know, welcomed when it rears its head. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, going back to what we said about everything about Gentoku and his new outfits. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, if you're a fan of the trope of the villain on his off days is actually not that threatening, Gentoku is the guy for you. <laughs> and that's oh, all God, I'll yes. say about that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and but, I mean, if we're talking about villains and being threatening and comedy, I mean, are we ready to go on to this guy or is there anyone else we oh, need we to discuss? Are. All oh, right. Oh, yes. D- Oh, God, yes. Yeah, so when I said that there are some things you can't talk about without spoilers, this guy is a walking, talking, dancing spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so... Well, he goes by many names throughout the series. Um, Soichi Isurugi, Bloodstock, Kamen Rider Evolt. Um, I prefer to call him by his fandom moniker, You Motherfucker. <laughs> um, this guy is just fucking Thanatos tier planning. Ke- like Keikaku Dori is mentioned more in this show than in some Death Note meme groups I've been in. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, like, <laughs> li- like he is essentially um the alien entity that came down with the Pandora box to try and destroy the world and nearly everything that happens from the first episode is something that he engineered in order to complete his master goal everything from sento's amnesia bonjo being framed for murder i mean everybody's character arc in some way ties back to him i think oddly enough except for sawa now that i say that oh yeah he's a he's a really impressive villain in terms of the way in which he continues to surprise and i think the um 
the fact that he's kind of there from the beginning and you keep getting um uh you just sort of keep getting learning more about him rather than th- there is a thing where you know it's this is common in a lot of media or whatever it's like oh well the, the true villain shows up in the last two episodes or whatever and i don't know like it this is such he's such a strong villain he's got such great suits he's there's uh yeah i don't know there's really nothing nobody else quite like him he's such a big personality um and it's one of those things where i always know when a character has really hooked me when i they change how i think about something very common uh in my own life and of course the word chow is now which is a very uh, which is just the you know an italian word that doesn't come up often but every time i hear it i just hear chow Chow. (laughs) i i hear it and that kick i can just see it in my mind's eye so Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning <laughs> that part of what makes a vault, I think, to your point, such a good villain, as you mentioned, usually there's a true villain or like arc villain throughout the series. The vault is present throughout the entire series, and I think mm-hmm. what actually makes him interesting mm-hmm. is um actually Parish illustrated this very clearly mm-hmm. when we were watching is um when Bloodstock first shows up, Parish's reaction was like, oh yeah, so I'm guessing this guy's gonna be like kind of our first act mini boss type thing, because. When Bloodstock right. shows up, the assumption is that Night Rogue is the main villain that we're dealing with, and even his suit is a counterpart to Night Rogue's, so they seem at mm-hmm. least to be equals. But within a few episodes, it becomes clear that Bloodstock not only has his own agenda, but it quickly supersedes and ousts Night, St- Night Rogue's own agenda, and he becomes the big bad. And mm-hmm. fr- from the rest of the series, and even as he you know goes back and forth between the stock, Isurugi evolt whatever you want to call him he's just consistently so i think what makes such an interesting villain is that with a few exceptions he's always so sure of himself and yeah you know with him initially being the coffee shop owner he has the added you know a what's the word the added gravity of being the former mentor figure for the characters and a constant feeling of like mm-hmm. everything you are i made you i know you better than you know yourself how do you expect to be right. me and it's to the point that <sighs> There are points in the series after he's an established villain where Sento still goes to him for advice, even though he's the reason for what they're fighting. He still has to go to him because who else can he go to? And I think that's what makes him such a great villain is you hate him, but, like, you can't deny, like, that he needs to be there almost. Right. For sure, yeah. Right. Right. And that, I guess that, like, that sense, especially because the... the, um the the sort of uh the home base coffee shop thing which is a a, a common trope in yeah. a lot of superhero stuff but but especially in common writer um the fact that he's the villain from the start and then you real like even their safest space even their 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 sanctum has been uh you know sort of invaded from from the word go it's uh yeah it's really intimidating yeah <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah and yeah, so speaking of character dynamics, though, um, we're going to talk about uh, Sento and Banjo. You mean the unambiguously gay duo? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> granted, we talked about this a little bit, but I mean, I'm not sure how intentional it is, but it does feel like, you know, Sento and Banjo ostensibly are best friends and, like, the partners, but, like, they literally refer to each other as the best match throughout the series multiple times, a moniker usually reserved for various power-up forms, but, like, you know... Yes, they're very close friends, but also, like, there is definitely, like, a much close... Like, it could easily be read as a romantic connection between the oh, two of them. Oh, yeah, a hundred percent. Like, to, I mean, mm-hmm. there's a... There's a, um... Let me see if I can find it. Uh, no, y- y'all keep talking for a second, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a meme yeah. real quick. Yeah. No, like, oh, uh, yeah. the, the way I pitch <laughs> this character dead. dynamic to, um, other people is essentially... And this is from the summer movie, not in the main series itself, but... There is a scene where Sento is standing out in the pouring rain without an umbrella, waxing poetic about how important Bonjo is to him personally, while a music box version of the main theme plays in the background. There's no heterosexual explanation for that. <laughs> That's none whatsoever. For. Dang it. Oh, there it is. <laughs> let me, let, sorry. <laughs> yeah, let me find okay, it. Um, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the fact that even the, this, again, we're going into spoiler territory here. I mean, they basically sacrifice the world for one another. Yeah, yeah um, I mean, their, you know, their love language is just reckless self sacrifice for the other's sake. Their entire yeah. dynamic yes. is just a constant game of who can sacrifice more for the other's happiness. And they say as much <laughs> multiple times in the series. Oh, absolutely. I, yeah. Uh, I mean, their final win, form win. is literally yeah. the two of them combining. 
Yeah, let me find here. I, I just found that I'm going to send it in the Discord. But yeah, uh, Banjo was was frequently referred to as a bisexual icon uh, by many fans uh, yes. <laughs> when, when the series was airing. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the I guess that's another thing that's uh, important to understand about Common Rider is that uh, in the the modern space, uh, Toei very much. Uh, at least it, it, it perceives its demographic to be um, the young children watching the show and their mothers who are watching it with them. So if you're here for uh, handsome fellas uh, spending time with one another, that is in ample supply, I would say. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yeah. send you to a promotional image. This is this is an official promotional I think I know image. which one you're talking about. Yep, I knew it. My uh, God. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's like, look. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. No. Okay. You, it's not even subtext, folks. Yeah, it's not subtext. <laughs> it's the highlighted text for sure. <laughs> Underlined in red. For those of you who are listening who can't see this, what we are looking at here is Bajo and Sento are on other opposite sides of a wall, and, and yeah, like clasping one another. Okay, kind of like a certain <laughs> Shakespearean play. The name escapes me at the moment, but they are Sento is holding Bajo's biceps. As Bonjour, like, reaches up and has him grabbed by the shoulder. They're looking yearningly into the camera. Yes, exactly. Like we, this... like we caught them in the middle mm-hmm. of something. It, yeah, it's very th- much like, oh, you're, th- oh, you're here. Uh. Th- this, <laughs> this looks like the cover of, uh, of the kind of fanfic that uh, made us not use our show's initials to promote it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a uh, it again. It's not. I wouldn't even call it subtext. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to call yeah, it subtext no. when when this exists. Yeah, uh, it is straight <laughs> up that uh, that scene from Community where Sidio Chag is just like, ha, gay, but positively, <laughs> positively, but positively, exactly. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It no, it's great, and I I mean I think that's one of the things about. Uh, I mean, obviously the show. I don't know. You know, they, they don't ever smooch on screen or anything, but it's hard to call it. Sub- I mean, they, they know what they're doing. Uh, <laughs> they know they're putting that Historians there. would say that they were the very best of friends and spent the rest of their <laughs> lives together. Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of the ending we get oh, for them. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, they, they sacrifice the world uh, to, to be with one another. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, yeah. what else can you say? Uh, <laughs> what can you say except fellas? Yeah, Fel- fellas. Fellas. <laughs> Yeah, but, um, yeah. Oh, man. man. And, I mean, we've talked so... I think it says a lot about the show that it's tokusatsu, and most people think of it as, like, action scenes with, you know, a pretty loose plot. But we haven't actually talked about the action much this whole time. Oh, no, we really haven't. Yeah, I mean, Um, what is there to say other than the fight choreography is just masterful? Yeah. 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 Especially the the whole b- final boss area of the screen where they're of the of the series where they're just fighting their ways up through the different levels. Oh yeah, they straight up game of death the finale and it's brilliant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh it's a show that uh you know Common Rider has a lot of hot blooded yell boys and if you're just there for the character drama and the cool suits. You know, you're certainly going to be satisfied with what Build is offering you, but um, it's also got really great action. Um, and you know, Toei has uh, these suit actors. It's definitely an art and and a skill to be able to make these um, rather ridiculous suits uh, make the fight seem convincing and have weight and uh, a sense of importance and impact to all the attacks, uh, especially when you know quite often they're flying through the air with laser beams coming off their feet. Uh, but mm-hmm. the fights in build really have stakes and are really well choreographed. And um, just the, even the sense of how they fight um, is really brought through. And I, I, I can't compliment uh, Toei's team enough. They just, the suit actors and stuff are just, it, it's really impressive watching them do what they do um, and convey these characters when it's not the actor's actually inside right so spoiler alert yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah sorry to spoil the illusion there kids but uh you know, yeah. your favorite power rangers and we're never in a suit for a single fight scene yeah right <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, the, the fights are really great. All the, the character attacks and stuff are, are really exciting to watch. Of course, everybody's got their favorites. I'm very partial to uh, uh, Kentoku's uh, The Kamen Rider Rogue, the big cracking, the crocodile. Oh, the yeah. crocodile, uh, yeah. You know, crocodile Rogue, like the big cl- clacking <laughs> jaws, cracking, 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 cracking. Oh, it's such a yes. great yeah. effect. I mean, the freaking yeah. like um, horror movie scream at the end of his transformation theme <laughs> song is just <laughs> the ice on top. So good. Yeah. So good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... It, just I think the best thing for me is the um, Splash Driver belt um, is being voiced by freaking Norio Wakamoto. Like, <laughs> Which, the oh, voice cool. of evil, terrifying badassness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For, God, what was the name of the guy he played in Code Geass? The guy with the huge-ass powdered wig. I don't remember. Uh, I mean, roles that okay. definitely come to mind for him are Vicious from Cowboy Bebop and Mr. Perfect Cell. Mm-hmm. Well, that's be- that's even better than what I was thinking. So forget yeah. my dumb idea. <laughs> oh my gosh. So what? So uh, what? Uh, what are you guys' favorite? So I think we kind of just uh, already got to our favorite suits, but, but yeah, mine is actually is the the like we just mentioned, Gentoki's cracking uh, Gentoki Gentoku's <laughs> cracking <laughs> cr- cracking crocodile. One. Like that's my favorite transformation or head sheet if you're a weeb um and it's also my favorite suit design so i guess just to narrow it down a little bit what was your favorite bottle combination like rabbit tank um hawk mm. gatling yeah yeah i know really tough choice like, uh, yeah i mean i'm partial <laughs> always going partial to rabbit tanks as kind of the base design and i just you know seeing that design is part of what sold me on this show seven grass recommendation i just love the sleekness of it and the red and blue mm-hmm. i mean that's a winning color combination anyway you slice it but i mean i'm my favorite like base best match is definitely um hawk gatling just because yeah the first fight scene where it's <laughs> using just like the gimmick of like flying around with the gatling gun shooting everything is hard not to enjoy that absolutely absolutely i think oh by the way we're not going to spoil how the lot the explanation behind what the best matches is, matches are because that is just a, yeah, no, that's worth hearing as character. it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I think my most underrated, uh, I think the most underrated design is the Ninja Comic one. Because I just... See, yeah, Ni- yeah, Ninja Comic was going to be mine if we're talking about uh, of Sento's forms. I love the mm-hmm. uh, the comic panels on the blade and all that stuff. Um, it, yeah, it's it's a, it's a season with a lot of terrific suits. And like you said, even just Rabbit Tank, the base form is so engaging and cool to look at. Um, and I think... It, you have to understand, like, that is a completely valid way to get into a series is to simply look at the suits and go, those suits are cool. I want to see those cool suits. I mean, like, that is that is 100% a valid way to enjoy uh, Kamen Rider, but also Build is, is a great series underneath all that, yeah. too. I but, mean, at the end of the um, day, they're trying to sell you the action figure of that suit, so... That's kind of oh, and it's working. Yeah, it's working, sure, baby. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm I'm partial mm-hmm. to Tank Tank as oh, well because it's such yeah. a yeah. when he starts like doubling up like Rabbit Rabbit and Tank Tank. Yes, um, Rabbit Rabbit is honestly my personal favorite. But yeah, yeah, there's so there's so much fun going on with the you know and the the combiner gimmick, uh, throwing together two suits is uh, certainly nothing new for Tokusatsu. Again, double right. uh, mm-hmm. was pretty famously mm-hmm. big on that. Um, a lot of Ultraman series do that too in a kind of different flavor. Um, but I mean, the series has a lot of excellent suits, and all you can—I think all you can really say—is that okay. Some of the suits aren't up to the same caliber, maybe. Yeah. But in terms of in terms of being designs which are are really exciting to look at, but at the same time don't. Um, the season before this, X Aid, uh, had some. Um, uh, is another season that I'm, I'm a big fan of, um, but a lot of people were sort of, I guess, dismayed by the suit design because there are times when it's really, really out there and weird. Um, the, it, that has a video game. They're literally video game doctors curing the gamer virus, which is just terrific. Wow, topical. Yeah, they, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, they level up their suits, and the level one suit designs are these kind of like waddly Fisher Price people, like potato <laughs> suits Aww. that are really kind of big and chonky. And like, I have a, I'm a big fan of them, but I also understand why a lot of people think they are like hideous and a sin before God. Like I get it. <laughs> I'll, I'll <laughs> Although, fully admit I legitimately dig X aids base. Um, I think it's like the level two design. Like that's his main, like, I guess rabbit tank equivalent. Like once I get through double and fours uh, or fours, however you say it, like I'm probably going to jump to X eight. Mm-hmm. Cause I honestly, I kind of dig that show's whole aesthetic. I know that it's really out there for some people, but it's out there in a way that I can get into. 
Yeah, I I think if you if you give it a chance, like the X Aid suits will just like really, really uh, resonate with you. Like, man, they're 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 super weird. I absolutely love them. I eat those up. But but the common rider build suits to get back to that are very very good while still being pretty recognizably common rider suits. Which you know, I will I will admit that the X Aid suits are sometimes so out there that they don't feel like common rider suits so i get that complaint yeah, but, but I, I always appreciate <laughs> experimentation within a long-running franchise even if it doesn't always mm -hmm. pay off yeah yeah it definitely x8 x8 takes a lot of risks uh top to bottom but um build i f it's weird because build doesn't really i don't know how to describe it it doesn't really it's not a safe series but i don't know if i would call it it, it plays either. it like, plays it, on a lot of established tropes but in like it puts a very modern spin on them like, going mm -hmm. back and watching Double and O's, which, again, those shows are from about 10 years ago, even then I could see a lot of, you know, elements that got brought back in Build, but I can also appreciate how Build had a much more, I guess, more modern take on it. It built on them. Hey. Oh! -ho, I will say, if guy, we're talking yeah. about um, <laughs> underrated or underappreciated suit designs, I'll say one that mostly, like, it was appreciated enough that it became a meme, but I think it only shows up once in the show. Um, the smartphone wolf combo, where he literally has a giant <laughs> smartphone as a shield, is just... And then the shield gets shattered when someone does a rider kick to it. I mean, I, I want to believe that they just... I mean, no, the fact that they built the smartphone prop for that one fight scene alone just makes my heart soar. This is why I love Tokusatsu. Yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. Uh, boy. No, I would agree. One of the reasons that, other than it just being a really, really good season, one of the reasons I recommend Build is because I feel like it's modern. It, it is both a modern series, but it's playing on with in a lot of the same spaces that a lot of classic series do um, because of the whole, like, again, human experimentation and secret organizations and, you know, am I a weapon? All that stuff is there while at the same time it has a modern look and aesthetic and modern design sensibilities. So it's like, it's a really good litmus test, I think, for the various um, series that have come before it. And I think it's very easy to watch build and then go, okay, I liked this part or that part. Where can I get more of that? And there's probably a season that will, you know, accommodate you, if you will. Um, so, so that's what I. That's one of the reasons that I like it. Again, on top of it being a really, really good season, um, mm -hmm. that's a. It's a good litmus test for like what you might also enjoy uh, in other seasons as well. Yep. Yep. Also, once. One small thing that I really loved about the series is that it, it established that like, all the transformation effects are in fact diegetic. Oh That's yeah, why they... <laughs> everything that the belt, everything, all the sound effects is all coming from the belt. Uh huh. Yep. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> and great belt voices with lots of real catchy oh, yeah. uh, phrases and stuff this season too. It's a it, it's a yeah. fun, it's a really good series. It's just really great to watch mm -hmm. and enjoyable and. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Although, watch Common Rider build. Yeah, <laughs> my my one criticism of it, my one criticism is that when they would all transform at the same time and they would all just start uh, talking at the same time, it kind of, kind of got kind of irritating. But oh, oh man, you're not ready for the movie crossovers then, because I've seen some clips of those team up the <laughs> oh, transformations. God. It's like if you when you're a kid, if you had a bunch of like you know press the button, try me action figures, and you ever threw yeah. them all down the stairs oh, once God. as a kid, like. <laughs> It's yeah. <laughs> it's everything all at once, all the time, happening so much. Yeah, oh, no. <laughs> all the things. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. Yeah, so, oh, but yeah, yeah, we're really pushing people to watch the show. Um, Grant, would you like to not tell people where they can't not watch this show? Hmm. Wink, wink. Well. If possible, like, in whatever way you think we could get away with. Yeah, well, the Toei ninjas uh, and their assassins are, are, are out and about right now. Uh, so we, we have, uh, I guess to put it into perspective, uh, in many ways, um, Tokusatsu is about 10 years behind in terms of availability uh, compared to, say, uh, anime, like if you're an anime fan. Um, so we're still heavily reliant on torrents and things like that, particularly with Kamen Rider, which has often struggled uh, to have any kind of legal base. Um, the the legal seasons that you can watch um, would be, at least a, as of recording, um, the original uh, Kamen Rider, the OG Kamen Rider from 71, and um, Kamen Rider Kuga, which was the uh, 2000 series, which sort of brought the series out of uh, 
uh, a long uh, dormancy are both on VRV. Uh, and I think there are a few others that are floating around now. Like I think Ryuki's out, but there was some issue with the subs. So technically there's nowhere you can legally stream it. Um, and sadly, many of the uh, subgroups due to getting some cease and desist from Toei uh, are currently uh, in hiding. Uh, so I actually don't know who is or is not still up or offering it, but it is out there. Uh, and I pray, uh, without ceasing, that one day everything will be available for people to watch. <laughs> yeah, which is, yeah, um, we could only hope. Yeah, Toei's marketing of Kamen Rider is in a weird place where they have official channels for advertising the merchandise, but no a- official channels for being able to watch the shows yeah. they're selling you the merchandise from. Yeah, and that's really, really bizarre. I mean, I get weird. it, it's a licensing yeah. thing, but it is a little disappointing that you can't watch the stuff to sell the because like i have purchased common writer things now that i have seen the shows so like <laughs> you know i, I, I like pl- please and it, th- thankfully um many uh, uh of the um super sentai seasons are available now through shout factory um quite a few of those uh, are available but um it's still uh, hard to watch common writer uh, so there are ways I'll tell you there are ways, but it is, uh, it is a challenge. I will say though, <laughs> um, you know, with the more, I guess, progressive or, you know, knowing what I know now about the whole process of adapting tokusatsu into American productions, like with Power Rangers and knowing more about what is lost in that air quotes translation process, um, mm-hmm. even with that ca- caveat, I will say it is still really disappointing that America has failed multiple times to get Common Rider adaptations to, um, catch on here. Especially since, I feel like mm-hmm. it shouldn't be that hard a sell. It's about badass superheroes riding motorcycles and kicking the bad guys so hard they explode. Which part of that is a hard <laughs> sell? <laughs> I don't know. Especially in the frickin' 90s. Like, that's the frustrating thing to me. They got Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, like, for all of its flaws, and it has a lot. Like, you could do a whole episode on that. For yep, all of the yep, flaws of yeah. Mighty Morphin, it caught on and became successful. And then after that, they fucked up Common Rider. You know, Mighty Morphin was definitely a right place, right time thing. You know, having that sort of combat saved by the bell in the early 90s, uh, it, you know, it worked. <laughs> um, I, I think now we are at a place where... You don't need to do, like, you know, Power Rangers was, I, I guess, sort of an analogous to Robotech, where it's like, okay, it had its time and its place in terms of adaptation, perhaps once upon a time. But I think maybe it's just time to sort of step aside and let the source material uh, just speak for itself and be available, especially because in this era of the huge uh, availability and excitement around anime and manga and things like that, like, it's pretty clear there's an audience uh, for this stuff um, in its, you know, in its sim- purest form. Um, so I would I would hope that they would just get it licensed and out there. But again, as it stands, they have not really done so, um, and that's a shame. Now I-, I hope Toei, they seem to be moving in that direction because they have um, on their YouTube channel, on the Toei YouTube channel, there's like a they have a thing where like all of their pretty much all their properties even their uh you know super sentai and common rider being the, their two kind of big ones but there are a lot of others um metal heroes and a lot of other kind of one-off things that um they have up there and they have the first couple episodes subbed for free and then they have all the rest available too but obviously those are unsubbed so i think the idea is they're trying to get people to uh to license them um so my hope is that eventually we will see you know, the needle move on that front. But right now I even hesitate to recommend anybody, uh, at least in a public space. Cause it's like, I don't want them to come after them. Cause these subgroups are the only connection we have right now for yeah. this material. And I'd be really sad if we didn't have that. But I, again, I hope one day we have official releases, you know, more, um, again, along the lines of, of Kuga and, and the OG series. Cause those are great too. Uh, they're obviously a slightly different flavor than the modern era, but they're really good. Mm hmm. Can I just say, uh, what was the what was the name of the actor who played the original Common Rider again? Oh, um, you can put me on the spot. Uh, his name it's with an F, and I can't. Uh, Hiroshi Fujioka. Fujioka. Thank, oh, yeah. oh God! Uh, I just want to get this out there because I want this to be immortalized in the realm of podcasting sound forever. Is that Mr. Fujioka is just one of the walking examples of a '70s chat. 
Oh yeah, no, dude was a <laughs> fucking stud. <laughs> Me and Black Belt are um, are brown dudes, so we grew up on Bollywood movies. The closest comparison we could get with uh, Mr. Fujioka is Amita Bachchan. So he and Amita Bachchan, they just combined to form... The epitome of 70s action movie machismo. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. exactly. And he really hasn't, like, uh, I think one of the things that's really great about Common Rider is that they uh, often on, uh, they, they bring the suit actors and the original actors back a lot. So see, every time seeing him suit up again, even in the modern day, it's, there's a gravitas to it. It's, it's really powerful. I mean, I guess it would be like, you know, watching Christopher Reeves, you know, step in the phone booth one more time uh, on television. It's like, ah, there he is. There's the guy. It's him. You know, it's really, really and great. That's one thing I love about um, Common Rider compared to like Power Rangers. Like, and apparently this kind of applies to both Super Sentai and Common Rider just because they're, I guess, taken more seriously in Japan or at least have a little bit more regard held to them than Power Rangers does, where in America it's kind of fallen off and the scene is kind of like, you know, C tier entertainment. We're, we're... Yeah, it's definitely not what it. I mean, even when it was at its height, it was obviously like, "Oh, this is just for kids." But it doesn't really yeah. have. It's not. It's not even like respected as good entertainment. But like with Super Sentai and Common Rider, so many of these actors like get catapulted to the heights of stardom from these being their breakout roles. Mm -hmm. But so many of them, when they have time, still come back for like return episodes or crossover movies, which I just. I always think that's so cool to see because with Power Rangers, so many of these actors, if they do hit it big afterwards, kind of like treat it as like an embarrassing thing they did in high school and don't really talk about it. Or like yeah. the actors who do like still kind of own it haven't done much since. Yeah, and I think part of that too is it, it's the perception um, and I guess the different, I guess, superhero language and clout. You know, a lot of people feel like <sighs> there's a whole there's there's a whole other discussion there, I guess, about how mm -hmm. superheroes are perceived and how they're supposed to act and, and what they do and all that. Um, you know, even within American superhero comics and things like that, it's like, oh, you know, Superman's dumb. I like Batman, who's very serious. And it's like, uh... listen, listen to yourself. Like, listen to yourself, you know? <laughs> but it's that kind exactly. of stuff. There, exactly! There's, there's not... There's part of, part of what makes Tokusatsu so appealing to me um, and what made Power Rangers appealing back in the day, too. But what, what makes it so appealing is it's... There is a very... There's a lack. I wouldn't say there's a lack of seriousness, but there's a lack of cynicism about the idea of superheroes, and there's very much an idea of commitment. Like if this, you know, if this episode is about an evil clown that kicks magic soccer balls at people, we're just going to run with it, and we're going to go all the way with it, and just lean into these themes and and do so authentically. Uh, and it's really refreshing compared to some of the like, I don't know. I guess the cynical element of a lot of modern. American style yeah, a lot of, superhero storytelling. Yeah, a lot of American modern superhero storytelling has really settled into the groove of what if superheroes were real but everybody just agreed that they sucked and that was the universe yeah, our stories yeah. were happening in. Like, like isn't mm -hmm. this silly? Isn't this ridiculousness? Like, no one, no one says that about. And obviously, it is ridiculous to have a have someone in like orange and blue who's a gorilla vacuum cleaner or whatever. Yeah. But you just you don't have people textually say it. You just lean into it, and that's part of what makes it feel uh, right. so engaging. Is because the it, at least in text they're taking it seriously, and it's really refreshing. I mean, the <laughs> fact that all of Asento's weapon, new badass weapons, look like the toy they're trying to sell is never once questioned or made as a joke. It yeah. is embraced no. mm -hmm. for what it is, and I love mm -hmm. that. Like. Yeah, like it's often said. I see a lot of times that you know with Tokusatsu, you have to like block. People recommend trying to block out that is trying to sell a toy. I embrace it. I'm into it. Oh, like yeah, yes. Yeah, Show me the big yeah. blocky plastic ninja sword that also shoots fireballs mm -hmm. and turns you invisible. That is what I signed up for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of the episodes where they actually use the toys. Like they'll just like okay. Uh, we're gonna have to do this shot. Like this happens a lot in Super Sentai. Like, okay, in this shot, we've got uh, the robot running, and in the scene, the ranger is standing on top of their vehicle. But you know, to the viewer at home, you can pretty you can see that's just an action figure standing on top of a toy robot. I'm into that. I think that's great. <laughs> yeah, I think there's uh -huh. actually uh -huh. there's fan. actually one scene in Build where um Utsumi and um Evolt both have out the um I don't remember what it's called. It's whatever the um like gun they use to turn into Bloodstock and Night Rogue is called. Oh yeah, those yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, the um the the, ste the, yeah, steam, the steam guns, no. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. both have steam guns out, but um, Evolt has the actual steam gun prop, and Utsumi is using a toy steam gun, so his gun is way <laughs> smaller than Evolt's, and nobody <laughs> brings it up. No, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whew, boy. All right. I think we've kind of talked the show to death now, Big, but um, yeah, overall, just we all agree that this is good shit. Uh, don't not watch it somehow. I'm sorry, I kind of lost the, th- the comedic thread here. So, but yeah. Um, don't yeah. not watch it, but if you do watch it, don't. <laughs> yeah, there, nailed it. Nailed it. Right. All right. And, um, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Girl. I was, I was going to ask one more. Uh, so, so I know, um, uh, Black Belt, you've talked about, uh, you've watched a few others now. Uh, what have you, I guess, what, what are some of the other series that you've enjoyed? since then now that yeah. you're hooked so the only other series i've watched all the way through is common writer o's which i absolutely loved totally very different from build but still has a lot of the same stuff i loved in it um a really bright enjoyable cast of characters um a mm. really in- it also actually has a, a mix and match gimmick for the suits executed differently but still really well and um yeah, I think one of the things in that series that I enjoyed a lot, and we've talked a lot about this, is the character Ankh, who, um, mm-hmm. all I'm going to say about him is that it is, a, it is you know, speaks to the mastery of the art of tokusatsu, and I'm not exaggerating anything when I say, you know, they manage to make you feel emotionally t- attached to a disembodied hand. Like, making a Mm -hmm. literal puppet of a hand one of the most compelling characters I've ever witnessed in a show, a kid's show nonetheless, is an act that I think, you know, should be celebrated. And as far as I know, Mm -hmm. is by the Japanese side of the fandom, which makes me very happy to hear that. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely speak to the the English-speaking side of fandom that Ankh has got to be one of the most, uh, uh, I guess, one of the most popular characters, non-writer characters ever. Uh, Ankh is, if you've seen the show, you're a huge Ankh fan. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Gotcha, gotcha. We love our sassy bird god. Absolutely. Like I said, I'm only two episodes into Double. I'm loving it already. It really, I mean, Grant, you know what I mean when I say it starts off with a bang. Um, Mm -hmm, Yeah, and mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's one of those shows, like, like, the characters are very instantly lovable and endearing, but also kind of assholes in a fun way. And it's, you know, it's like starting up an RPG for the first time, like, in a series. Like, it feels like a very familiar beginning, but you know it's going to go in a direction you're not quite expecting. And I'm really excited to see what that is for Double. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Double's, Double's a good starting place. It's also got the, um, um, uh, the, the, the Oh, yeah, it's another mix gimmick. and match series, yeah. Um, and, uh, D- Double's really good, um. I think really double superpower, uh, and it's not really said as much in the show, but double superpower is definitely the ability to put in a USB correctly the first time. I've never seen another hero with that kind of power. Uh, I will say the (laughs) one thing that throws me off whenever I'm watching double, every time they do the cyclone, Joker, I expect them to say best match, and they don't. (laughs) Yeah, you get used to different calls and stuff. Now, Presh, have you you investigated any others, or are you on on Uh, that path, or...? I am on the path. I've just been kind of following Black Belt's reactions on Twitter. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I've been really enjoying it. Yeah. Speaking of, if you go to my Twitter account, um, I have actually my p- pinned tweet is a bunch of Common Writer memes, but also in there is um, <laughs> my going watch thread for Common Writer Double, where I'll be documenting my reactions as we go. By the way, um, episode two has one of the most explicit this is for kids moments in any Common Writer I've seen. <laughs> Again, people who have watched it know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, no, I'm officially hooked on Common Rider now, and I yeah. can't wait to, you know, make my way back through all of the 20 years, I think, of content. I think that's out there. More, I think. Yeah, there's... Yeah, it, I mean, yeah. it's been going on, it's like on and off for a long time. Um but uh, I also, whenever you're ready for Super Sentai, let me know. I've got my recommendations. Oh, there. man. Super Sentai, good stuff I'm out ready there. to fucking go. Like, once, honestly, oh, once God, I finish yeah, Double yeah. and 4Z, I'm probably jumping straight into Super Sentai. 
good, good. Also, yeah. Forze, uh, it written by the same uh, writer uh, Nakashima who did uh, Gurren Lagann. Nice. Uh, so that that's a that's a fun connection there. And once you once you realize that that connections are like you're like oh yeah it's this it's, guy. Yeah, this as far as um, <laughs> writer seasons right. by um other popular writers, I know off the top of my head um common writer Gaim. Is that how you say it? Mm-hmm. The guy, yep. yeah, written Deep. by um Jen Urobuchi, also known as Himself. the writer oh. of Madoka Magica. And Thunderbolt Fantasy and many other things. Yeah. That's... Gaim is fun. That's the the <laughs> the fruit the fruit samurai uh B boy season. That's a fun yeah, one. Yeah, oh the, the way I described that to Parish after like watching the intro and like skimming like the pitch on um Rider Wiki is literally just um Rival dance groups reenact Sengoku era combat with fruit themed samurai powers. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's exactly <laughs> what I mean, it if is. that doesn't sell you on the series, I don't know what else to tell you, man. It, it seems pretty clear yeah. cut to me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you had me sold for the minute you mentioned Get Orobuchi. I'm sure. <laughs> those, yeah. those Godzilla movies notwithstanding, we don't talk about those. We all have our off days, yeah. we all have our off seasons. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we well we we got we all got bills to pay, you know. Sometimes right. you just you turn yeah. in something some part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what's yeah. Gaim so is Gaim is kind of no, kind of notorious in fandom just because Urubuchi is either a name that draws you in or pushes you away. I suppose. I imagine. But yeah, Gaim. Yeah. Gaim's look, the the, the the you know like a pineapple headed samurai superhero is a. It's definitely something that makes people go, wait, what, are you, what is this about again? <laughs> yeah. What, yeah. What's going on again, here? another thing I love about Tokusatsu, the, having super serious, often violent conversations where the most, at times, ridiculous get up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To- mm-hmm. There, there's, an old, there's an old adage that goes, uh, uh, Tokusatsu means never having to say, I'm kidding. <laughs> I love wow. that. Wow. I love wow, that. Wow, that is perfect. That is perfect. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, all right. I think that's a good stopping point uh, for this brilliant, brilliant show. Um, so now with the now with our closing moments, Grant, where could the people find you? Well, uh, you can find me uh, on Twitter, making all sorts of the usual nonsense comments that I like to make and, and silly jokes. Uh, you can find me at the Blade Licking Thieves, um, where I review. Uh, films and media and stuff like that with some buddies of mine on the couch. Uh, We like to get together and record. And uh, you can find me on the Super Senpai podcast where my buddy Pat and I uh, talk about tokusatsu Uh, quite frequently. We have to get together and record here sometime soon. Schedule's been wild. Um, (laughs) We're watching Ultraman Mabius right now. And um, you can find me writing for A&N. I do the, uh, mostly do the weekly One Piece anime reviews um, but I also write, I'm reviewing, you know, video games and, and light novels and whatever else they want to throw my way. Lindsay likes to keep, keep me, uh, keep me on my toes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so those are the main places you can find me, but I'm also here and about and wherever on wonderful shows like this. Like Busted yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. By the way, uh, thank you so much. Uh, to all you listeners out there, to all your listeners who are One Piece fans, um, as thanks to Grant, send him all of your best Nico Robin fan art, please. Yes, please, please. I need it to live. <laughs> I have yes. a condition where if I don't see Robin fan art every ten minutes, I'll pass away. Yeah. So please help. And if you oh, follow, God. if you follow Grant, you know from his retweets, he's not currently in any danger. But it never hurts to be safe. Never hurts. Never hurts. <laughs> oh boy, Black Belt. Where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Black Belt nineteen ninety eight um, or probably in the Dungeons and Dragons aisle of your local game store if you look really closely. <laughs> uh, you can also find me on Instagram at 404 page not found. <laughs> <laughs> and of course saving best for last. Um my name is Parish Maharaj. You can find me on Twitter at noblekind92. You could follow the show at busted limes. That's limes like the fruit. And um yeah, to all of our listeners who have found the winning formula. Thank you for busting a line with us. I'm just jamming out at the opening now. <laughs> Say you will. Be the one, be the one, 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 the
So good. It's so good. I don't know any of the words, but it's so good. <laughs>